be looking at the next section, the last lesson that Jesus actually teaches in this context of the dinner uh, to which he was invited. Uh, so let's read verses 15 through 24. And then we'll take a look at it. So this is what we read. When one of those who are reclining at the table with him heard this, and again, this is what he had just said about um, being repaid, those who help the poor and invite them to the banquets and so forth will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And by the way, that also reminds us that even though Jesus might be speaking to one individual, there were others who were listening to him. So it wasn't just directed to uh, one person necessarily. But when one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled, and blind, and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges, and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his, his word to our understanding this evening. Now, remember this morning we saw Jesus telling his host that the next time he had a banquet, he shouldn't invite those who were close to him or at least continue to invite them exclusively, his friends, his brothers, relatives, or even his wealthy neighbors in the hope of getting an invitation back from them because that would be repayment in full. Instead, he should invite the destitute, the crippled, the lame and blind, those who couldn't repay him because the Lord said that he would reward him uh, at the resurrection of the righteous. And again, I just want to point out that um, when Jesus said that the man would be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, he's essentially telling us that this is what the righteous will do. Only those who are righteous will be a part of the resurrection of the righteous, those who have trusted in Jesus. And so if we are able by God's grace to to do what he calls us to do here, to minister to the poor as the Lord gives us opportunity out of a genuine love for God, because we do need to remember that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that one can give all their possessions to the poor, their body to be burned, but still not have love. It profits nothing if it's not done in love. So if we're able to do this because we love the Lord and want to honor him, that is one of the ways we show that we really belong to him and we can know that he really will reward us when we stand before him on that day in the resurrection of the righteous. And I think by that he certainly means um, standing among the sheep because the resurrection of the just and the unjust actually takes place at the same time, but they are two different groups and obviously we want to be in the group of the righteous and we certainly will be if we are trusting in the Lord. Now, so far at this particular um, meeting, our Lord Jesus has taught us a few things. To be consistent in our love, remember to keep all the commandments all the time, even on the Sabbath. To humble ourselves to serve others, don't exalt yourself, but rather humble yourself to become the slave of all, and that is how you become great in the kingdom and to do what we can to relieve the suffering of those who don't have enough, knowing the Lord will reward us on that day. Now this evening, he moves to his fourth and final lesson, the blessing that those who inherit the kingdom of heaven will receive. It's really the blessing of inheriting the kingdom. Okay, so what we want to look at uh, this evening are two things. First of all, again, and this, this can be kind of a difficult thing, 
to, to think about in, in certain respects because of, um, well, just because of the way it's been represented perhaps in differing churches at different times. First of all, what this blessing actually is. What is the kingdom of God? What is so great about inheriting the kingdom? Okay? Is it streets of gold and great mansions? Are we looking for uh, worldly wealth transferred, as it were, into heaven or to the new heavens and the new earth? Is that, is that what the blessing of the kingdom is or is it something more? And then secondly, we want to look at who it is that's going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, first of all, let's again look at what this blessing actually is. Now, after Jesus finished speaking about the rewards the righteous will receive for taking care of the poor, somebody sitting at the table with him said this in verse 15, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, it's interesting that, that certainly what he said is true, okay? And Jesus would agree with him. But the thing they would disagree on is why those who break bread in the kingdom of heaven are blessed. Because the kingdom that Jesus had in his mind is different than the kingdom that this man had in his mind. Jesus was thinking about a spiritual kingdom, one that encompasses the earth and one day will be basically confined to the new heavens and the new earth, where this man was thinking about a physical, political, military kingdom. Now, Jesus, when he speaks of it, he knew that it was a blessing to be in the kingdom. He knew the heirs of his kingdom had many good things to look forward to. And these are the things that we have to look forward to if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first one is the one I think we, we probably think of first of all, and certainly I think we ought to, uh, and that is being acquitted or being cleared on the day of judgment. That's one of the blessings of being in the kingdom is we actually inherit the kingdom, which means we have to pass through the judgment. Now, sometimes, again, aside from you know, the streets of gold and the mansions and so forth, this is perhaps what believers think of the most. God's going to accept me. He's going to, you know, he's going to spare me the judgment. I won't have to suffer forever. I won't have to be in the fire, but I get to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, if that's all there was to the kingdom, that would certainly be a reason to be thankful, right? But there is really much more, certainly more than many Christians think about, certainly more than what the Jews thought, again, not just this man, but all the Jews and even Jesus' disciples. Remember I mentioned the, uh, the passage from Acts chapter 1 where, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the time when you're going to basically get rid of the Romans and, and you're going to set up your political kingdom? And uh, Jesus didn't really address that. I mean, he had been talking about the kingdom for quite some time. They still didn't get it. But he says, okay, just wait, and I'm going to send the kingdom to you, and you're going to go out and you're going to expand the kingdom. It's different than what you think. It's more than that. But again, realize that was the Jewish mindset, and it's more than that. The kingdom is actually the reward that Jesus deserves, the reward that he receives for the work that he has done for the Father in the plan of redemption, for his perfect obedience, for his laying down his life. That reward really consists in several different things, all of which the Lord gives to us. Remember, we become joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. What he has earned becomes ours because of our union with him. You know, we're, we're united to his life. That makes us spiritually alive. But we're also united to him in a legal sense, which means that everything he has becomes ours, not just his righteousness, but what that righteousness actually deserves. And as I've said, it's several things. One of them is... Certainly that, that heaven that we'll receive during the interim period, but it goes on beyond that, first of all, to the perfect world that the Lord is going to bring. Remember this present heavens and earth, Peter tells us, is being reserved for renovation and purification by fire, and one day it's going to be made into a new and perfect world where there will be no sin and no suffering, there will be no death, no more tears, but everything will be perfect. So first of all, it encompasses a perfect world. 
But that wouldn't be perfect without also a perfect relationship, which the Lord is going to give to us with himself, with the Father and with the Son. And in that relationship, for the first time in our lives, we are going to be able to love the Father and the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit with our whole hearts, and there won't be anything to get in the way. And we will experience their infinite love, and that for all eternity. It's going to also include a perfect fellowship with other believers. We're going to see the believers of all ages and spend time with them and with the angels joining together to worship the Lord and to give him thanks for the mercies that he has shown to us, the one who has saved us. We do need to remember that Jesus is a savior, not only of mankind and those that the Father has chosen, but he is also the savior of the angels. The reason why the holy angels did not fall into sin was because the Lord was preserving them for his son to use to minister to us who would, those of us who would inherit salvation, right? So God's purpose for us is the reason why the Lord reserved the holy and the, what, what are called the chosen or elect angels. So there's also an election among them. And they will be thanking the Lord too for choosing them not to fall away from him, but rather to serve him uh, in the kingdom as uh, basically ministers to those who inherit salvation. It will also be uh, the, the sight of perfect and infinite beauty. You know, we, we talk about, um, I mean, what, what, we like to go travel, we like to look at various things, and the reason why we do is because certain things we find to be beautiful or attractive, right? When we went out to Germany and we were looking at old buildings, that was interesting, you know, these huge edifices and so forth, the churches, the Assam Church, which was like a showcase for um, basically Roman Catholic churches that had every form of ornamentation. That, that was amazing, but it wasn't um, what I'd necessarily call beautiful. But looking at the Alps, that was beautiful. Looking at uh, the, you know, the mountain lakes, looking at the meadows, just the scenery was just, was just gorgeous. But that's nothing. Nothing compared to what, you know, what is really wrapped up in the Lord in what's called uh, the beatific vision or the blessed vision of God. And to see our glorified Savior sitting at the right hand of God. That's something we won't want to take our eyes off of. And then lastly, it's the perfect joy in the Holy Spirit uh, who will make us able to enjoy the things that we see and experience in heaven forever. And again, what's that like? Well, think about the time when you experience your, your greatest closeness and nearness to the Lord, when you experience something of that joy. Just think of that and then ramp that up several degrees, you know, beyond anything you've experienced, and that is what every day in heaven is going to be like. Now, again, we only have that little foretaste of heaven. We can't fully comprehend, we can't fully appreciate now just how glorious those things are going to be in heaven. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, it's not absolute, but it's still... In, 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 a, in a very large degree, hidden from us. But we do know something of what it is like from that foretaste of the Holy Spirit, which is why Paul continues in verse 10, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. That, that's basically the down payment that what we experience of the Spirit's work within us, that taste, that foretaste of glory that we have. Jonathan Edwards pointed out that that little taste of heaven is really what makes us go heavenward and what makes us spend the rest of our lives desiring that we might have the full inheritance that we will receive on the day of our resurrection. And if we if we understand that, we understand something of what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, when he says this, when he talks about, um, you know, the creation is groaning, longing to be set free from its corruption. He says, and not only this, but we, but also we ourselves, 
having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, we groan for a couple of reasons. First of all, we want to get set free from this body of corruption. We want to be free to love the Lord perfectly. We also want to be free from the limitations and, and the afflictions of the, these bodies as they grow older. Particularly, it gets difficult to live in this house that's being torn down. We want that house that the Lord has prepared for us in the heavens. But we also groan because we want to be where the Lord is. We want to experience that fullness the Lord has prepared for us, that which we only have the foretaste of. It will be beyond anything that we can think or imagine. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. That is certainly true. But then the second question is this, who is going to inherit this kingdom, this, this blessing, the blessings of the kingdom? Now, it's very likely that the man who said this believed that he would be one of those who would inherit, who would be blessed to be eating this bread in that kingdom. And really, all the Pharisees believed they were going to be a part of this, and all the Jews believed they were going to be a part of this simply because they were Abraham's children. Now, Jesus told them this parable, and again, he told this to the man who said this, but again, let's remember there were others there who were listening to show him and to show them that they were mistaken. So again, let's, let's read the first part of the parable. A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. First one said to him, I have bought a piece of land. I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, the man, of course, who gave the dinner is the father. He is the one who has provided everything that we need to enter into the kingdom of heaven through his son, to receive the blessings of being at that banquet. Those who are invited are the Jews. God made the promise of his kingdom to Abraham and to his children, okay? Uh, that the Bible is very clear about. Now, in this parable... Jesus appears to be referring more specifically to the spiritual leaders of Israel because we know that not all of Israel was rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the meal was ready, he sent his servant to call those who had been invited. I believe that Jesus here is referring primarily to himself because he is the one that, is, that, is, that came preaching the kingdom, inviting all who were willing to come. He says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, at the beginning of his ministry, the time is fulfilled, and basically the dinner is ready, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Come to the supper, right? But none of the leaders would accept his invitation. Remember, they wanted to kill him. And notice that each of them had their reason for not wanting to come uh, to Christ, one bought a piece of land that he needed to inspect, another five yoke of oxen that he needed to try, and another had just married. One of, the th one of the things that all of these have in common is that they are all grounded in the world. Okay? These are worldly things, pleasures of the world. The religious leaders, Jesus is saying, were more interested about their, more concerned, I should say, about their interests in the world, the wealth the honors, the affluence that they might have, then they were about the kingdom. The Jewish leaders saw Jesus as a threat to their comfortable lives. They said, if these Jews, you know, come and make this man king, then the Romans are going to come in here and take away our place and our nation. It's important that he die. And so they rejected Jesus. You know, Luke tells us that this is the reason why they refused to be baptized by John as he's preparing, you know, the people to receive the Messiah. Uh, we read in Luke chapter 7, verse 30, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized 
by John. So again, they rejected Jesus because they wanted what they had now rather than what Jesus had actually come to bring them, which was the kingdom of heaven, which was spiritual, which they didn't fully understand, but which is far greater than anything they could possibly have in this world. Now, when the slave reported this to his master, the master became angry, and he said to the slave in verse 21, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Now, commentators believe that this is still targeting the Jews because notice where he sends them, to the streets and lanes of the city. Okay, and the city is the city of the Jews. But this time, he is not sending them to the well, but he's sending them to those who are sick, who aren't well, to those who are desperate. Those Jesus had actually told the host, remember? that he was to invite to his next feast, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, those who would be more open to receive it, but I think in this case, in a more spiritual sense. Uh, although, in a very real sense, those who are in this condition were much more apt to receive the kingdom than those who were well and didn't have any problems. Uh, listen to what James writes in James chapter 2, verse 5, something we read this morning. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Remember how Jesus says in the Sermon on the Plain, we've already gone through that in Luke's gospel, blessed are the poor. And unlike the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't say blessed are the poor in spirit, but he says blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the reason is because those who are poor are much more apt to receive the kingdom than those who are rich. And I think... Um, Years ago, when, when we were part of a, of a um, uh, basically a Bible study, home Bible study group that um, believed that we should be out evangelizing, and we were going out and evangelizing, when we went to the places that were the more you know, well-to-do and affluent people were, they wouldn't listen to us. But when we went to the places where the people were, were poor and down and out, they listened to us. Uh, what James tells us here is true. So he sends them out to those who understand their poverty and who uh, will listen. And then when the slave had completed his task, he returned and said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And so the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. And here I think we see him turn to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles, those who are outside the holy city, to the highways and to the hedges. This reflects, again, that commission that Jesus would later give to his disciples. Uh, when they asked him about the time of his restoring the kingdom to Israel, he said to them in Acts 1, verses 7 and 8, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So Jesus comes and he preaches the gospel in, in Palestine after he's crucified and resurrected and ascends into heaven and the Holy Spirit comes. He sends his disciples to continue to preach in Jerusalem and then in Judea. But then after they've had a chance to hear it and either accept it or reject it, he sends them to Samaria. Philip goes and he preaches the gospel in Samaria. And then finally to the Gentiles, he calls the Apostle Paul and sends him essentially to evangelize the whole known world at that time. And as a result, the Father's house is filled. Okay? All the elect, all the chosen uh, are brought into the kingdom of heaven. So essentially, uh, what we see here is the, the progress of the gospel. Um, he comes to those invited first, those to whom the promises were made. They reject him. And so then he turns to the despised among the Jews, and then he turns to those despised by the Jews, right, which would be the Samaritans and the Gentiles. But then we come back to the end and ask the question, what about those that were first invited? Okay, what about them? What happens to them? Jesus says they're going to be shut out of the kingdom. 
Uh, we read in verse 24, For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Remember how Jesus says on another occasion that many will come from north and south and east and west and they will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out. They're cast out for rejecting Jesus. Okay. So, again, the blessings of the kingdom, who are they for? Well, they belong, of course, to, um, they belong to Israel, but when they rejected it, the Lord turned uh, to the nations. Now, one thing we do need to bear in mind here is that it's because of their rejection that the Lord has turned to us, uh, that he sent his servants into the highways and hedges to invite us into the kingdom. It's because they, the, the spiritual leaders of Israel, were so tied to this world that we have become the heirs of the kingdom. Now, there's a lesson, I think, in there, isn't there? Don't get tied to the world. Those who love the world do not love the Father. Those two are mutually exclusive, right? So we need to make sure that our hearts are not entrenched in the world, but rather in heaven, and they certainly are for trusting in Jesus. But the fact that this would take place in the way it did was the Lord's plan all along to bring Israel's blessings to the nations, to bring them to us. And now we are blessed. Now we will not perish forever, but we will enjoy that perfect world without suffering or death, that infinite love of the Father and the Son and that ability to love them, that perfect fellowship of every, with, well, with every believer from every nation and the holy angels, that view of our Lord's perfect beauty and that fullness of joy that comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit, those are the things that God had promised to the Jews that they rejected for the things of this world. Okay. So we need to thank the Lord that he has opened our eyes to see the glory and the beauty of those things and to desire those things more than the things of the world. As we think about that, we should also ask the question, what should we give to the Lord for the blessings that he has given to us? Well, the psalmist writes, we should lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. What we are to give him is what we're going to be giving him forever in heaven, and that is worship and love. Love him with all of our heart here. Even though we can't do it perfectly, we need to do it best we can and grow in that love. We need to lay down our lives for him every single day and follow him as our Lord Jesus calls us to. But there's one other thing that we should do, and that is be a part of that part of this parable that's really still ongoing. You know, the gospel has gone to Jerusalem and to Judea. It's gone out to Samaria, and now it's currently going out to the, um, basically to all the nations, to the uh, uttermost part of the earth. Uh, we should be a part of that, okay, going out with the Lord to the streets and the lanes, uh, we should be going to the Jews still as well and to the highways and hedges to the Gentiles to bring in those who understand their need uh, of a Savior, <clears throat> to those who are poor, to those who are crippled, to those who are lame, to those who are blind, to call them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, two things. The Lord doesn't want us to forget that he's not done with the Jews. Okay, He isn't done. He has turned to us and he gave us these blessings because of their rejection. But the reason he did that was so that when they would see us enjoying the blessings that were actually meant for them, and there are blessings connected to the kingdom that are in this world, such as you know, peace and assurance and assurance of pardon and communion with the Lord and the spiritual blessings that come with that, when they would see us enjoying those things in this life, the things that were meant for them, it would provoke them into receiving their Messiah. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. By the way, I think Paul here is not referring to the ones where Jesus said they will never taste of that meal. You know, they're going to be shut out of the kingdom and cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, those were rejected, but he's talking about those Jews that haven't actually sinned against the Lord to that degree that still have, you know, hope of being saved. 
The Lord is not done with the Jews yet. We were talking about Messianic Jews this morning. The Lord is saving those who are from a Jewish background, and uh, we need to be thankful for that. We need to pray for that. We need to be a part of that as the Lord gives us opportunity. But let's not forget He's not done with the Gentiles either. There are still Gentiles to be gathered in. If that weren't the case, if there weren't Jews and Gentiles yet to be saved, then we wouldn't be here, right? The Lord would have come. The fullness or the, the resurrection would take place in the final judgment because that will take place when the last Jew and Gentile have been saved. So let's remember our part of this to continue to pray, to continue to share the gospel until, by His grace, His house is actually full until they have all come in. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to show our Lord our thankfulness and love for the blessings He's given to us by being a part of what He calls us to do uh, on earth. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to, to help us.